Okay, uh, first let me apologize for all the noise in the background. I'm going to try to stay focused. Uh, instead of doing the video that we plan to do, we're going to do a, 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 a combination of videos uh, that we were going to put out but never got around to putting out. Uh, due to the window that was put through the... Uh, sorry, due to the brick that was put through the window, we are undergoing repairs right now. And so all that machinery and um, hammering that you hear is the fixing of the window and putting in some extra reinforcements so that we don't have to worry about the building being destroyed. Um, so uh, I'm going to start with um, something that uh, Donna Newman has been requesting that we put out and, um, and we're also going to end with something that I've been requesting that we put out and uh, we let the council vote on these videos. So the first one we're going to put out is one that Donna Newman wants. It, it, this came out on November 7th, 2018. It's called Media Bias and the Midterms, but it's also a, 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 a remixed video. So we hope that you enjoy it. And, um, yeah. Sorry, sorry about the noise. Well, there was a big win for both parties last night as the Democrats flipped the House of Representatives and the Republicans did expand their control of the Senate. But how big is this win compared to other midterm elections? Is this just another record and a hamster wheel? Well, R.T. Sarah Montez de Oka joins me now to take us down memory lane, midterm memory lane. And do we have as much of warm and fuzzy feelings uh, about this midterm as past? I think so. I mean, Scotty, last night we saw these big wins for both Republicans and Democrats. Now, the buildup for the midterm elections seemed a lot more heated than usual, almost at a presidential level. But while there was a huge voter turnout increase in both parties, it seems like history largely tended to repeat itself. And Trump had no problem calling it a huge win for the Republican Party. We saw the candidates that I supported achieve tremendous success last night. As an example of the 11 candidates we campaigned with during the last week, nine won last night. This vigorous campaigning stopped the blue wave that they talked about. I don't know if there ever was such a thing, but could have been. If we didn't do the campaigning, probably there could have been. And the history really will see what a good job we did in the final couple of weeks. Now let's start with last night. The Democrats took control of the House. Republicans will expand its majority in the Senate, as predicted. And while there are some historic moments, like more than 100 women elected to Congress, which is a record number, the shift in congressional control is really nothing new at all. Nearly every president sees his party lose scores of seats in Congress during these midterm elections. When President Obama was in office, we saw the same that the president's party taking blows and losing ground after a historic presidential win. Now, during the 2010 midterm elections, President Obama lost the House in a wave much bigger than last night's, largely a backlash to the Democrats passing Obamacare. And in his second midterm back in 2014, he saw more losses again in the House and, more importantly, lost control of the Senate. During President George W. Bush's midterm election in 2006, the Democratic Party captured control of both the House and the Senate and also took control of many governorships. Now, this was in large part thanks to the protracted war in Iraq and Bush's response to Hurricane Katrina, among many other issues. But in 1994, during Bill Clinton's presidency, the Democrats faced a historic loss during the midterms. This was known as the Republican Revolution. The Republican Party gained a majority of seats in the House for the first time since 1952. They also took back the Senate and brought an entirely new generation of conservative politicians right into government. Now, Scotty, we should also note and take into consideration that not only was last night's midterm not unprecedented, it will likely change very little here in Washington, D.C. The Republicans will still be able to confirm judges and cabinet appointees in the Senate. The only major change for Democrats is taking control of the House committees and really the ability uh, to issue subpoenas. So perhaps that's why both sides today are comfortable in claiming their victories on each of their sides. First, we need to grasp that the Democrats are not an alternative to the Republicans. The 
the Republican Party is, as its namesake suggests, a Republican Party. And of course, the Democratic Party is also a Republican Party. The Republicans have long accused, you know, for some time now, the Democrats of somehow being socialist, even though this is just not true. And the Democrats, at their best, are centrists. Alright, so, at the very best, the Democrats are right-wing, and at the very... Sorry, at the very best, the Democrats are centrist, and at the very worst, they are right-wing. So, yeah. And for some time now, um, the centrist Democrats have gone further and further right-wing. In fact, in some cases, the Democrats are even more right-wing than the Republicans. And again, pro-life and pro-choice has nothing to do with the left, the center, or the right. That is a non-issue to the left-right paradigm. Let us recap. Neoconservatives are not conservative. Neoliberals are not liberal. If we want to truly dive into this, then let us start with what liberal really means. Liberal refers to liberality. Liberality is a principle that asks for fair social norms. Thus, only the socially liberal are truly liberal. Then we have that other word, conservative. This is a word that can only be applied to such groups as the Amish, the Mennonites, the Jehovah's Witnesses, and even Satmar Jiri in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Thus, only the culturally conservative, yes, only the culturally conservative are truly conservative. Furthermore, political liberalism is a sham. Political liberalism, also referred to as classical liberalism, would be seen in the American presidents such as FDR and JFK. Today, there are not many classical liberals in the United States of America left, although at one time there were several of them. Now, the best example of a classical liberal today would be someone such as Jesse Ventura. Now, this brings us to the political conservatives. Political conservatism, political conservatism, which is also a sham, uh, would be referred to as several things to depending on who you ask. But for the sake of not getting into the several different phrases people say when they want to identify uh, political conservatives, as opposed to, for instance, uh, neoconservatives, I'm going to provide one that I've seen from those who actually adhere to actual political conservatives, that being that they refer to themselves as old-school conservatives. So, old-school old conservatism uh, would be seen in the American presidents such as Eisenhower and Carter. Yeah, Carter was not liberal, Carter was actually conservative, and he was, for what it was worth, an actual old-school conservative. Uh, the best example of an old-school conservative today would actually not be anyone we know about in America. Today, the best example of an old-school conservative would actually be Vladimir Putin. Now, now um, the real reason why I'm getting into all of this is because um, I need to... We need to. I mean, I don't know if anybody as... I don't know if anyone is as nearly as gun ho about getting through with this as me and, of course, Don Newman. But, I mean, I think that I am very... There's a lot of stuff she completely outclasses me in. But I think when it comes to this particular issue, I'm enraged at the confusion when I understand the definitions better than most people. So, for instance, Chris Hedges is a democratic socialist. I've said this before. Bernie Sanders is not a democratic socialist. He's not a socialist at all. And what needs to be understood is Bernie Sanders is often referred to as a social democrat, and, and he might be, but what, but, but what Bernie Sanders really is, is a progressive. 
Now, all these young people and the Democratic Socialist Association of America, or whatever that's, whatever you call that stuff, they may call themselves Democratic Socialists, but at best they are Democratic Socialists, at worst they are progressives. It's not, I'm not trying to slander progressives or social, social Democrats, by the way, and I, I would say that they're actually progressive social Democrats. That would probably be the best description. Um, Bernie Sanders falls into the same camp as Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. Uh, she won an election, by the way. Uh, she is not a liberal, because liberalism in the United States of America is completely dead, just as conservatism in the United States of America has completely vanished. Now, what's what's being done here is that the progressive social democrats or democrat uh, or, or or the social democratic progressives or the democrat social the progressives who also might be social democrats depending on how you look at that uh, they are the new centrists they are trying to take the democratic party back for the center i suppose that they are using the term socialist because social What's going on, basically, is everybody is coming to realize that there's no way to save capitalism. So, what do you do if people look at the communists and they're scared of the communists? Now, there are things that, from a Buddhist point of view, we can definitely criticize about the communists. There are other non-communist socialists that could make some serious criticisms of communism. However, it, it goes deeper than that. There are socialism has been completely demonized, and so putting the word democratic in front of it makes it sound hip and cool. Not to mention, socialism looks like it appeals to a lot of people. Uh, people aren't completely sure why, but I guess what it is, they meet socialists from South America and other places, and they're like, wow, that sounds pretty cool. But they don't want to give up their iPods and everything like that, and I'm not saying you have to exactly give that up in socialism. I mean, if socialism came to the first world, you probably wouldn't have to give up any of your toys. Uh, would you pay more taxes? I don't know, but let's get this straight. Um, your labor is more taxed than anything. So you look at the check and like, oh, the state has taxed me this little small amount. Do you know how much your labor is being taxed by your boss? That's a lot more. And you don't want to pay taxes well. you can kiss the roads goodbye, you can kiss the electric goodbye and all that other stuff. And actually that stuff would be better off in the public sector. I said public sector, by the way, not state sector. And although those two things intertwine, there is somewhat of a difference. And that gets into another thing about YouTube not being a state utility, but needing to be a public utility. And I am already getting off track. So, we are seeing progressives retake the Democratic Party. That's not a bad thing per se. And the reason for this is because we need the left to be heard. For the left to be heard, bringing the center into return might be necessary. But should we depend on the center? And the absolute answer to this is always never. We never depend on the center. Are we going to support the center? Strategically. Strategically and very crafty. We have to be very careful of the center. See, unlike what the assholes at PragerU will say, Dennis Prager is like one of the biggest liars, he's not even an alternative right, which... Screw the alternative right, that's what alt-right means, by the way, which is fascist, but he, he's not some alternative version of the right wing, by the way. Just so you know, he represents the old guard right wing. He Actually, in fact, he represents the traditional position of the neoconservatives from basically basically the Ronald Reagan, Ted Cruz type. Yep, that would be what Prager U represents. Well, PragerU and all this other, mostly PragerU, but some other institutions of falsehood, which their whole point is not even reactionary, but just keep a conservative, uh, a neocon status quo intact. That's the only, that's the only point to uh, PragerU and such other groups that float around telling lies on YouTube. Uh, they make the claim that the Democratic Party is going extremely to the left. That's not true, because if that was true, how the hell, how, how the heck did the centrist Bernie Sanders lose to Hillary Clinton? Wait, he did not lose. She stole it from him. 
And yeah, she won the popular vote. And then, yeah, Trump, you know, won through the Electoral College, which, by the way, the Russians cannot hack. You can't hack the Electoral College. The fact of the matter is Hillary is angry because she lost fair and square. Why did she lose the Electoral College? Is the Electoral College a good thing? No, it is a terrible thing. It's another symptom of the Republic that must be removed. However, um, she's not against the Electoral College. She's one of the most right-wing people ever. Would she have moved the embassy? I don't know. But it's highly likely that the Electoral College wanted it moved, and they they weren't sure if she'd do it. If Bill was brought back into presidency, which fortunately cannot be happened, he probably would. Because he started the Oslo Accords, which was just a land grab uh, scam, which, yes, Arafat kept the promise, and every Israeli leader since has not. So... Trump is just the fulfillment of Bill Clinton. And if you know about Donald Trump, he's friends with the Clintons. And the friend and the Clintons are also friends with the Bushes. There there is no real genuine divide. The divide would be like among family members who have to basically cover for each other so that people don't figure out the big family scandal. So they have their disputes, but when push comes to shove and you and me, the proletariat, have a problem with what they are doing, they definitely will cover for each other. And that is how it goes in Washington, because Washington is completely outbought and outsourced to Wall Street. The uh, progressive pushback is not limited to the United States of America. You also can see this in Mexico now. Um, the new uh, president-elect for Mexico is Andres Manuel López Obrador. And... I am so ashamed that I am not pronouncing that as well as I can. Here I am Spanish and I can't even pronounce all of the Spanish words that I should. So let me try it again. Andres Manuel López Abrador. I think that that's how it's done. I mean, I can really get into it if I'm enough around enough Spanish music, go figure. Uh, Judo Spanish music is a good way to really get me involved. Of course, hearing songs about Che Guevara also helps. Anyway, Andres Manuel López Abrador is a member of the Institutional Revolutionary Party, which is a progressive party, generally, uh, you know, centrist, very centrist and not socialist, as in it's not left-wing. Um, however, from what I understand of the history of that party, it had a left-wing and it had a right-wing to it, and the result was it's it's synthesis is it's centrist now but this pushback says a lot about what's going on there is a centrist fear of fascism now such lying talking pieces like prager university which i don't think is a university because as they don't offer degrees from what i understand uh, Prager U uh, says that socialists co-opted the liberals. No, it's the other way around. Liberals co-opted socialists. And when they did so, they didn't keep it in the center, they went further right. The best example of this is that there is a communist party in the United States of America. I don't know if it's still around, but it was recently around. It was at least around in the last uh, presidential election. And instead of, in fact, endorsing Bernie Sanders, who claimed to be a democratic socialist, they endorsed Hillary Clinton. That just shows you uh, what's really going on. The Democratic Party did not move further to the left, it moved further to the right. And what you're seeing is an attempt to put it back into the center by the progressives. Now, Mexico is a different matter, but uh, he's the president elect. This shows that there's a pushback against fascism because a lot of people would want to bring the center involved. But they figure if they can't have the left, they could at least have the center. I mean... Anyway, um... This is a video pertaining to the new president-elect of, uh, Mexico. Andres Manuel López Abrador. I think that I'm getting better at it. You know, I, 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 you know, you know, I have it in my blood. I'm Spanish. You know, I should be able to. Uh, this film came out. It was published July 2nd, 2018.
Mexico has witnessed a tectonic shift in its political landscape, with a leftist outsider claiming victory in the presidential election. He says profound change is now coming to the country. Marek Gazdiev has more now on the man who's set to take power. Andre Manuel Lopez Obrador, or AMLO for short, the new and somewhat colorful president of Mexico. A real underdog whose party, Morena, ended almost a century of rule by two of Mexico's dominant political parties. Not bad, huh? And as is fashionable these days, uh, often justifiably, AMLO ain't exactly a fan of Trump. We have to convince and persuade those Americans who are manipulated by Donald Trump's campaign of United States first or America first. That's a fallacy. It's nonsense that actually goes above the national limits of universal justice and fraternity. Now, when I say not a fan, I mean he really doesn't like Trump. Even wrote a book about it called Oye Trump or Listen Trump. Of course, you can't have a proper election nowadays without a little of the old Russian meddling or at least someone complaining about it. Actually, initial signs of it in, in the Mexican uh, presidential campaign already. There's an aspect where we want to confront destabilizing behavior with, with Russia. As we know that Russia has fingerprints in a number of elections around the world. My advice would be to Mexico would be pay attention. Pay attention to what's happening. Even in Mexico. And AMLO, to his credit, found it really funny. I'm just here watching the weather, waiting for the Russian submarine to come, with my people and with gold from Moscow. His supporters even made a jacket for him, with the word Manuelovich on it. Get it? Andrei Manuel, Manuelovich, it sounds kind of Russian. To his credit, he even wore it. Be it his dislike of Trump, his sense of humor, or whatever else, he swept the election. Preliminary results, he got more than half the vote. His rivals eating the dust. To be fair, he's had some practice. It's his third attempt at presidency. Bit of a sore loser, though. When he lost the election in 2006, he staged a fake inauguration party for himself. Never mind that. Good practice for the real thing. Congratulations, Mr. Manuelovich. Vladimir Putin sends his regards. I return us now to our previous presentation to which more commentary shall be provided. Well, I know it's shocking that President Trump considers this to be a success out of the gate. But, you know, there's a real issue about the subpoenas. Is it enough that the Democrats can just challenge and say and throw subpoenas at him and throw ideas of investigations happening and it not go anywhere because it could be put down by the Senate? Is that enough for the Democrats to be excited about? For now it is. I mean, it was something that they weren't sure it was, you know, the voter turnout turned out to be more than even they expected. and. So we'll, we'll see what happens, but they're excited. Well, you know what? At least both sides can win. I like when everybody is winning. At least somebody got a participation trophy yes. somewhere. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. And as you watched the midterm coverage across the networks last night, I doubt you were surprised by the coverage. We spoke to Larry King about the state of the big three cable networks. Uh, and they don't do news anymore. In fact, RT is one of the few channels doing news. RT does news. CNN stopped doing news a long time ago. They do Trump. Uh, Fox is Trump TV, and MSNBC is anti-Trump all the time. Okay, uh, that was very interesting. Well, all right, all right okay, wait, ne next part. Now we're joined by Robin Anderson, Professor of Communications and Media Studies at Fordham University. I have to say thank you for joining us. I know last night was an interesting night for you. I'm sure you had your popcorn going. So I have to ask you, what do you make of the way that the media has covered these elections looking at 2016 and then now to 2018? I mean, is it hard to see that they're kind of rooting for one side or the other? Well, no, I, I don't think so. I think that the media has been kind of drug kicking and screaming um, to a whole new women's wave. <laughs> and I think that uh, the over 100 women that uh, made it into elected office uh, last night was really incredible. It was very diverse, women of color. I think the Me Too movement has 
has forced the media to uh, do a little bit of soul searching in terms of the way they cover some of the, uh, certainly the women candidates. You've got um, you know, Alessandra uh, Ocasio Cortez, the youngest woman now uh, entering Congress, entering the House of Representatives at 29 with a teacher with a Puerto Rican background. And uh, I uh, just found out from Donna Newman that she is very skeptical of Asia Cortez. Um, one thing that I think should be said here is that um, in Arizona, men are more oppressed than women. Now, on the flip side, the more men are, are the more men get oppressed in Arizona, the more women get exploited. So, men being oppressed in Arizona hasn't helped women. It's actually made stuff worse. I mean, when you really look at the real demographics of men and women in Arizona, it's very bizarre. And um, I think sometimes that the war of the sexes is done by design. But that's how they do it in Arizona. In Arizona, if you're a woman and you don't have much family or you're fallen, you've fallen away from your family or you're poor, you are more likely to be exploited. If you are a single male or a single father you'll most likely never get custody of your of your of your children that's just not going to happen um yeah so who's more oppressed well in the eurocentric system women are definitely exploited by men but women were oppressed and exploited men have gotten oppressed but they didn't get exploited by women. As women oppressed men, men found new ways of exploiting women that were even worse. So this is just, it's hard to explain what I, how to convey what I'm saying. Uh, we definitely do a study on this. Um, I find it easier to work with Hannah Toff on this matter because Marion Emmisberg is more like me. She's masculinist, and that might be too much of a bias. So I go to Hannah Toff, who's more egalitarian about these things. We're, we're going to go to the next clip. I think there's certain celebration uh, that that uh, is completely appropriate. No, I, and, I, and I agree with that. But now, are we past the point of days where we can actually look at, at media folks and think that their opinions are not infiltrating uh, their reporting? I mean, is it kind of unrealistic to think that uh, those that are hosting or those are reporting don't have an opinion and it's not showing through in their work? I think that the way the, that the media is owned by corporations, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think that anybody even in front of a camera has the ability to say uh, what is just politically on their mind. I think they followed very standard news frames. Um, if you look at the new Media Matters uh, study of uh, just that was released five days ago, what, what they found was that on the morning talk shows by the three main networks that the vast majority um, of the sources that are invited to be on those programs um, are, ha are trending Republican and conservative, 48.8% of them. Um, lefties are 8.8%, uh, and neutral people are 42%. So the media is um, still moving in a conservative direction, and I think it's a very loud voice from the American public, um, which uh, is actually under minority rule at this point. If you think of the mainstream opinions that most Americans hold, they want health care. They want Social Security, they don't want schools to be dismantled, and they, they want equity in the economy, and those are the kinds of things that are not happening uh, in the, within the Republican Party that controls up to la last night, that controlled um, all, form, all, all of the uh, levels of government. Okay, those were all actually very good points. Um, I mean, she did bring up a lot of things that... I, I don't know if I actually disagree with. I don't know if I completely agree either, though. I mean, that she sounds. She seems like a woman that would be a very, very. I, I get the impression I'd have a very interesting conversation with this woman. I don't think we'd completely agree, but I do think that the conversation would be intellectual for what it's worth. Um. Yeah. So. 
I'm not so sure if I understand her position of what's right, left, or neutral, whatever. We've already expressed what the left, the right, and the center is, so whatever. Um, I think what she thinks of the media going in a more conservative direction really is a reflection of the society. And as far as Americans wanting more health care, of course, Americans want to be taken care of just like any other uh, people of any other country, oh, first world or third world in that sense uh but i think that we should point out that if you really the only way that we can humanely do the healthcare thing is if we decrease the wage of the rich and redistribute the wealth evenly and do an immediate halt on the exploitation of the third world we don't often think about that if you want to raise healthcare and education standards we need to start doing heavy taxes on the rich. We need to stop exploiting the third world. But I also think that it's important to point out that um, we need to start arming ourselves because the police are a hostile force that are getting worse and the United States military should be completely dismantled. Are, is the system going to do that just because we voted out of existence? I seriously doubt it. Can we work on some type of legal deterrence? There's always legal deterrence you can do. Um, we are strategizing such a concept right now, you know? All right, so next clip. Well, I think conservative media outlets would probably point out, or conservatives, those on the opposite side, like the Media Research Center, would probably point out the fact that the reason why there's so many conservatives as guests is because the media itself is left, and the majority of media have ties to the left. So I think, you know, maybe that might be one of those reasons. Oh, okay. I mean, that's 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 a really bad appropriation of words. The majority of media has ties to uh, liberals. You mean liberals, not the left. How does the left have? I mean, this is an amazing appropriation of words. Uh, whatever. Going forward, here's the question. You know, we used to have people that were hosts, and we people had analysts, and you had people that were opinions contributors. Uh, you know, can we ever get back to the days of even, even Walter Cronkite would put his, his opinion in every once in a while, where you can just get the facts, the straight, hard, who, what, where, and when from a news story, from a political story, that without getting some sort of tinge, either left or right, about the why that story is happening? Oh, I think that there's a lot of investigative reporter and serious news that's being done all over the country. My colleague Beth Noble, who used to work for um, CBS, just published a, a, published a book about um, ex a, a, researching investigative uh, reporting and factual reporting in the nation's newspapers and found indeed on the front pages of most of the country's newspapers, investigative reporting is alive and well, and that is very fact-based. And so uh, I think that the idea that people are influencing their opinion um, mostly certainly corresponds to, I think, Fox News. Uh, when you have Sean Hannity, uh, who's, a, who's an anchor at Fox, going out uh, and, and stumping with President Trump, even, even though some of his fellow journalists didn't like that, that shows some kind of very extreme bias. <sighs> Okay, um, no. Actually, the entire news media does not do investigative journalism. Don't you watch Chris Hedges? Like, you have to literally go to RT and watch Chris Hedges if you want to hear some investigative journalism, or watch The Real News Network, or Democracy Now! And even then, I'd have problems with some of these programs. I think a lot of us would. Uh... I have to admit, though, that this guest is one of the smartest liberals I've ever heard spin things. I think it would be a very intellectual conversation to have with her. Of course, she would definitely not agree with me on certain things. I mean, but, you know, this is, this is the thing. If you watch a lot of RT, one thing I guarantee is that you will start to think. They, they will show you it from so many different angles. Um, but, um, yeah, SNBC and CNN and Fox... The, the, these are all bad, and uh, the New York Times is a terrible, 
terrible at investigative journalism. Uh, the Post is terrible at it. They may have at one time been really good at it, but maybe, but 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 no, 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 no. Uh, American media is pretty much garbage. It is, it's not only corporate media per se. It's it, it has a lot to do with how backwards the American culture really is in the first place. It's a colonial culture. What else could I say about it? It's in or it's not organic as a culture. It, it, you know, the melting pot. Melting pot is another word for assimilation. You know, you should think about that. It's a hostility. That is the world, unfortunately, that we're living in in the 24-hour. And they get ratings. That's the, the problem with it. Now, Fox News did come out, and uh, they definitely did denounce uh, Sean Haney being involved in that rally. But, Robin, I want to thank you for joining us, and we'll have you back on, because I'm sure this is a conversation that will not end. Well, that was all very interesting. And... Um... You know, I stopped paying attention to anything that ever came from Fox News. I don't even know why that's taken seriously. Fox News doesn't just make InfoWars with Alex Jones look good. It can even make Glenn Beck from The Blaze look good. That's how bad Fox News is. Fox News is really that bad. It's... I don't know the difference between Fox News and Prager University, and Prager U is completely garbage. Well, I hope this has been entertaining for everybody and informative. All right, so there has been a question about whether the Bundist movement is for or against feminism, and that's actually a very complicated question. We find in our studies, and yes, we go way, we, we take Frederick Danson and Herbert Dillon, Marcus Din Jamal and Shabazz Din Jamal, we take their historical perspective over that of Karl Marx, because Karl Marx was, in fact, a historical revisionist. I mean, he believed in the Hegelian point of view, which does discredit Marx in some context. Also, Karl Marx wrote The Jewish Question. And yes, Leon Trotsky and Joseph Stalin are both superior to Karl Marx. Karl Marx is an inferior to them both. And that is because at least Leon Trotsky and Joseph Stalin tried to get somewhat away from the Hegelian position because they found that the dialectics worked better without the Hengelian illogic. Well, of course, they couldn't completely do that because they had to have that sense of continuity typical of any Marxist, and they were both Marxists. Anyway, feminism arose in reaction to male chauvinism, which rose in reaction to European egalitarianism, egalitarian meaning equal equality of the sexes, which worked for the Americas, but was never quite the way of the old world, that being Africa, Asia, and Europe, which was patriarchal, a word that is demonized all the time. In patriarchy, there are matriarchs and patriarchs. In, ma in matriarchy, there's only matriarchs. But people have twisted language today, and so when they speak of sexual egalitarian, instead they'll say matriarch, but that's not true. We find that feminism was a reaction to male chauvinism, which was a reaction to European egalitarianism, because this is how colonialism works. You know, it was early liberalism, basically. Now, I don't have the time to get into it, but this is something that will be touched in the manifesto. Hannah Toff identifies as egalitarian. She considers feminism to not be necessary. Now, Africa and Asia didn't suffer with these European problems, except, except for China. And that is also something Frederick Danson touched upon. And 
this gets very complicated. Like, this gets really complicated. But you don't have to take my word for it. Hannah Toff would like it if we would sit back and watch a video from Sikladi. She was still part of the Machika movement back then, and we still adore her very much. Um, this video is called Maternal Colonialism Feminism. It's from the channel Nikatlaka Warrior Women. Again, this is Sikladia who is giving this pre this presentation. Uh, this was published on January 16th of 2014. Today, I want to finally talk about maternal colonialism. The reason why I even started this channel to begin with under an Awak Women fight was to protest and to denounce um, all of these pro-colonialist feminist theorists and authors that are basically brainwashing are young women into believing that there is nothing of value, nothing of importance in our culture. We are presented our culture as indigenous people, as Nicantlaca people, through the eyes of Europeans. And in my knowledge, in my quest for knowledge, in you know becoming a member of the Mexica movement, all I knew was Cheri Moraga, Gloria Saldua, Sandra Cisneros. I just knew the pro-colonialist feminist um, approach to history. I didn't understand who I was. And so it was a very powerful experience to understand that machismo, because we're raised to think it's a Mexican thing, it's a, it's a Mexican Central American thing, right? That it's definitive of our culture and if it's definitive of our men, but it's not. Through the process of learning your history, of decolonizing yourself, you start understanding that our history um, has been told through the eyes, obviously, of white supremacy, of Eurocentricity, and uh, a lot of our women, a lot of the Chicana, or now they're called Latina feminists, self-identified Latina feminists, they took on that perspective and they write, they wrote all these books, um, speaking as mestiza, speaking as as colonized people, and not really asking and not really um, trying to decolonize themselves, but basically passively accepting that colonized mentality. And so in learning my history, learning my my understanding my history and decolonizing, you start to realize that feminism, you have to look at the roots, you know, let's not try to make it seem that, you know, it, our ancestors um, had feminism because we didn't. Feminism, by its historical creation, from what it really meant, from the very beginning of it, was the white woman's approach was their denouncing uh how appalled they were that they were being treated like like Nicantlaca women were being treated, like black men were being treated. They were like, wait a second, we're above these people. Why are you treating us like your inferiors where you and I, white man, are superior to these races? So what white supremacy did and what they did on, on our continent was the sexist mentality that they had in Europe when they came here, when they invaded us, when white women started coming over and joining the, the colonialism and all these genocidal machines, they said, wait a second, you know, how are you treating us inferior when actually they're the inferior ones, these primitive, these savages, right? And so the creation of feminism was their reaction to trying to get a piece of that white supremacist pie. And a great um, caption of this, and I'm going to read for you from this great book that is a very honest telling of what really took place during the suffragist movement, um, what birthed feminism in the so-called U.S., is this book called White Women's Rights, The Racial Origins of Feminism in the United States by Louise Michelle Newman. This is a great book that tells you candidly um, what it was like for in, um, indigenous women and also uh, other women, you know, that were not white and how we were viewed. OK, so feminism is what uh, I've heard this um, concept before. I don't know where exactly where it came from, but this this aspect of uh, feminism, what we're talking about is maternal colonialism. Okay, even though they're talking about the third wave of feminism and all this, 
Feminism was created for white women to get the fruits of white supremacy. They wanted to also be part of the white supremacist world. Even though we try to twist it and shape it and make it reflect who we are, it has no business in our culture because we as Nicantlaca women, we as indigenous women, we didn't need feminism. Okay, The concept of machismo comes from Europe. The concept of not educating a woman because she's a woman comes from Europe. Okay, let us not forget that our ancestors were the first to have mandatory education for males and females. Okay, we were the first to have mandatory education. In our societies, we had doctors, priests, poets, writers, merchants. And I will talk more about that in other videos. And I have talked about that for lots of years. Um, but today, I want to talk about maternal colonialism. Let me read you a very, I think, of a, uh, a very, this summary this as this paragraph basically summarizes what this book is about and it's a great interpretation of what took place and they're talking about social darwinism obviously eurocentricity another word for white supremacy and the birth of of the suffragist movement or the women's the white women's movement the simultaneous development of two ideologies, women's rights and social Darwinism, accompanied and made possible white women's entry into the public sphere at a time when new corporate and monopolistic forms of capitalism were creating vast differences in wealth between an educated white manager, um, managerial class and an impoverished, often immigrant and non-white working class. Social Darwinian theory is encouraged and enabled to develop the development of ideologies concerning white middle class women's emancipation and emphasized white women's specific role as the conservators of race, of race traits and the civilizers of racial and class inferiors. The Anglo-Saxon Protestant women's self-proclaimed burden at the turn of the century was to help her nation in rescuing these so-called primitive and working class peoples from stagnation and decay, to protect them from the violent abuses of the U.S. government and primitive and working class women from the supposed abuses of their men and to assimilate evolutionary inferiors into a more advanced Christian civilization. White women who participated in domestic and foreign missionary societies in the local, national, and world temperance movements, in the settlement house movement, in the international peace movement, in any of the organized white women's movements at the turn of the century, built their institutions on the premise that they, as Anglo-Saxon Protestant women, were the best conveyors of advanced civilization. Supporters of the Women's Settlement House Movement could be quite candid about the relations this ideology produced between themselves and the objects of their civilizing efforts. Catherine Coleman, a professor at Wellesley College, observed, another quote, a settlement is a colony planted in a strange land by immigrants from a superior civilization. Who house has become a potent force in the civilizing of the great city wilderness where it was planted? So that's a great summary of what feminism was and the truth behind the origins of feminism. Okay, in the essays that I have and the videos that I have um, presented, we in the Mexica movement are talking about this. We are talking about denouncing Eurocentric ideologies and not using Eurocentric ideologies as the measure of justice and as the, the actual um, origins of what's going to liberate us. Something that was created for Europeans or whatever a concept and ideology will only benefit them because it was created and intended to benefit them no recognition no inclusion no respect about us the nicantlaca people so let us not forget that feminism is maternal colonialism it is the white woman trying to get her piece of the white supremacist pie on our continent I will talk about more issues regarding what our women actually did, the type of um, roles that we held before 1492. We need to cleanse ourselves from that Eurocentric view that tells us that our ancestors were uncivilized 
and that women were treated like crap and that European women um, are the, the prime examples of womanhood. And this book is a great example, an honest conversation on the truth behind feminism. And it is, it is called the female aspect of colonialism, maternal colonialism. That is what feminism is. Machismo is not Mexican. Machismo does not belong to our culture. We have to denounce every ideology and every concept that has infected us for the last 500 years. Think about it. I will talk more about this in future videos to come. But for now, that is a great introduction to start understanding the history behind feminism. Thank you so much for watching this video. Uh, please message me any questions, any thoughts that you have. Share with me what you know about this. And I will be making more videos. Thank you very much. Siglali from the Mexica Movement. So, Donna, what do you think about feminism in light of native rage towards it? Oh my god, I think it's racist. It can never be redeemed. It should be thrown away with the KKK. So you agree with Hannah then? And Miriam. Hannah and Miriam. Okay. <clears throat> uh, um, so, um, if you recall, I uh, did my first interview with Jason and Rue. It was referred to, uh, um, it was titled, A Dialogue Between the Bundes Movement and Maoist Rebel News. A lot of people loved it, and certain people hated it. I'm kind of embarrassed by it, but due to popular vote, it, it remains. And besides, Donna Newman does not like the idea of any videos being removed from the channel. She actually pre-approves all videos, by the way. But um, the most important part was selected by Donna Newman. And it deals with the concept of 9-11. Some of us believe 9-11 is an inside job. Some of us only believe the uh, official story. And some of us uh, believe that uh, there was foreknowledge. None of us believe the media's narrative. But Jason Unruh brings up something I think that's interesting. A fifth position. That we're just not being told the whole story. And that would main that if you hold that position there are five positions. I guess there's a lot of positions because one thing is definitely the case. What the media projects is not what's going on. So I think that it's important that we get to this piece of that because out of all parts, the part that I actually am glad that I did was definitely this part. Although, I, I do wish I wasn't so sporadic, and I'm not sure why I had to... I, I think I have to spend more time explaining why I keep bringing up Alex Jones. What my love-hate position on Alex Jones is. Um, although, I don't deny that he's crazy. And I, it, it's complicated, because out of all people, why scrap him first? Why is David Duke allowed to run amok, and why is Glenn Beck allowed to run amok? It begs a question. Although... Nonetheless, Alex Jones is wrong for what he does. And I may mention that. I don't want to ramble here. Um, it's, I, I don't know how to talk and deal with the noise, so that, that's why today is all excerpts that you know we were going to give you anyway. And um, yeah, this is from a dialogue between the Buddhist movement and Maoist Rebel News concerning the subject of 9-11. By the way, I go with the official story, and it's none of your business what I personally think about 9-11. I'm pretty sure Dr. Robin Weisfeld holds the same position, by the way. I think he does, at least. He might not. Tell me what do you think, though. Um, is it, it, Do you think this is highly coordinated? Because I'm going to mention something very... Again, I, I cons and it's not because I think Marxists are afraid of it. I think... Well, I think Marxists are afraid of talking this, this about this, and I don't blame them because there's been a lot of shills promoting falsehoods. But I think that there's a thing that harms us in that I have stated, for instance, that there are conspiracy theories that have weight to them that we should look into. But the problem is, is most th conspiracy theories are manufactured. I connect this to COINTELPRO. In our primary documentary, um, I mentioned that 
most most conspiracy theories are manufactured. We need to start COINTELPRO awareness because we have a higher likelihood to survive revolution if we're aware. So, for instance, the Black Panthers, if they had been more aware of what was going on and how highly coordinated the provocateur and the infiltration really was, they may have been able to push back. Of course, part of the fault lies on them, ironically, for going into electoral politics to the degree that they did. Like, I'm, I'm not so upset with local city elections to an extent but to an extent if the position is still to get rid of the country like the u.s the united states of america would have to cease to exist it would have to but um what do you think about manufactured conspiracy theories i mean can you see that i mean I, personally i think that's why they actually got rid of alex jones because he wasn't really with their program in fact to me he's the only one that wasn't he was just an opportunist who was really good at selling it and he was crazy Whereas all the other shills they've kept up for some reason, just not, you know, because I think Alex Jones at times did harm the system, but I think he destroyed himself because with that Sandy Hook thing, he really destroyed himself. But like, what do you think about the idea of manufactured conspiracy theories? Because. Yeah, I definitely think that there there is a, a degree to that. Uh, for example, we were talking about 9-11 with the four different theories, but uh all the ones that question it are painted a certain way with one broad brush, even though they are different things. For example, saying that I don't believe the official story because I believe that there is information that they are withholding is not the same thing as saying it was an inside job. But if you do say, I don't think we have the whole story because of information that's being withheld, you're treated like it's a conspiracy, like you're being a conspiracy theorist. So they are kind of pushing that, that false narrative in, in, in that way. Well, it's funny because I, I, I honestly don't know if it's an inside job, but I knew credible people who truly believed it was an inside job, and they had weight to what they said, but they were never listened to. They would listen to people who would pin it on things that couldn't possibly have anything to do with that. Uh, again, you know, um, I, I don't see how that doesn't smack of infiltration, but I get tired of talking about 9-11. The reason why I bring it up only is because one of the th processes, and, and I guess you're a good opportunity for, for this one of the processes I want to do is I need to justify to people who do believe it's an inside job, who have a clear head about why they say that, why we are not going to promote that. Because it, it's it, it's not that we should just compromise if we if we truly have a stance on something, but that there's no way that the whole 9-11 truth, at the very least, at the, at, the, at the most was fake to begin with, at the very least – hasn't been completely taken over. And the, and the official story itself – which is not purported by the media, I, I do find damaging. And I find you get way more done by showing where Al-Qaeda came from, who Ronald Reagan really was, and how that all works. You get so much of the wall breaks down. You know, the wall of lies breaks down once you do that. You know, um, like the only conspiracy theory that I openly talk about to everybody that I maintain is that Danny Castellaro didn't murder, uh, didn't commit suicide. But of course... That's what's funny is that's never covered in conspiracy theory circles or in media. And I think it's because it's not really a conspiracy theory. It This relates to the Iran-Contra affair, which they pretend never happens now because we already know what the Iran-Contra affair is. We already know about um, – we already know what was going on. We already know that there was a complete and total regime change starting with Ronald Reagan – that continued all the way to Barack Obama, and that with and Trump is simply a new phase of that. Um, we we know that, and we may we may not all know that we know that, but we do all know that. And they they don't want us to catch on to wait. If you want to know who Barack Obama is, understand that he's the liberal Ronald Reagan. Because because I think that I. I think that there's a big effort to distract people with conspiracy theories because if you – like I said, the Iran-Contra affair, the uh, church committee opening of Conchel Pro, I mean they didn't they want a lot of this stuff released. But the fact that it did get released and the fact that we're seeing patterns and then with the leaks like Edward Snowden, this is I think very damaging to the system. I mean you talk about breaking the system. I think it could break the system over time. I mean it wouldn't happen right away, and I think that worrying about the environment might be a little bit more – of a necessity right now because what we'd only have what nine ten years to be alive because of the uh because of the planet malfunction caused by corporations i mean yeah well um what 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 do you think um we could do concerning um 
combating uh, manufactured conspiracy theories because they're still everywhere. And when you say something against the establishment, you do get labeled a conspiracy theorist. I, th- I think it's important to look at it from a from a scientific approach. What would genuinely criticize the system and what sounds like it really wouldn't be criticizing the system? I think I think that's that's a good way of looking at it. What would point to capitalism being wrong and what would be kind of looks like you'd be distracting away from it kind of thing. I just think that more of a um not necessarily like like a scientific investigation but like a, a what's the better way of putting it? A political scientific way of looking into it, like rather understanding the contradictions of society rather than looking for some kind of if, if it sounds like it's too simple to explain everything, it probably is. I, I, I can dig that. So basically, from what I'm hearing you say, we need to basically look at the material conditions of what's happening, what's obviously in our face, and the contradictions of what they say on television and what they say now on the internet as they've appropriated that too. Like the obvious elephant in the room that nobody wants to talk about. Because, I mean, let's face it, the cause is the United States of America and capitalism. There is no Freemason conspiracy. It's America. It's the Pentagon. It's, it's, uh, it's the profit motive. That is exactly what's happening here. Yes. And they're finishing up the construction now. It doesn't sound so bad. Um, what what you're hearing largely by the way is the windstorm <laughs> there's been a windstorm going on um, they they almost got the the last window sealed up um, but you can still hear from the outside the sound coming in I think that it's important to understand that given the attacks and the correlation of the attacks and it's not to say that all of our foes are in cahoots, but we have the JDL Zionists trying to do us harm. We have neo-Nazis trying to do us harm, and we have one of the most rogue uh, divisions, or one of the most rogue cells of, or the most rogue uh, versions of the Trotskyists uh, trying to do us in. But what is interesting is, is that when me and Uri Adia were kidnapped, the JDL Zionists had an FSA flag. Now, Assad is a despicable person, and the FSA is despicable. If we're all united on Kurdish autonomy, then let's be united on that, but let's also be united on not letting Syria get invaded by the West, and we can discuss the contradictions from there. I think that we should hear Uri Adia out where he's coming from, and one thing I will say is it... It really should have been the Kurdish. It really should have been the Kurdish revolution and the Syrian revolution a long time ago. But the sectarianism between the Kurdish and the Syrian needs to end. And what is the real answer is national cultural autonomy for all people within the country known as Syria. And so I give you something uh, a hard knocks lesson on continuity of government as a way to end this presentation. Thank you. Now let's talk about Iran. You have a whole website devoted to stopping war. Uh, www.stopiranwar.com Do you see um, a replay of what happened in the lead up to the war with Iraq? The allegations of the weapons of mass destruction, the media leaping on to the bandwagon. Well, in a way, but, 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 it's, but you know, history doesn't repeat itself exactly twice. What I did warn about when I testified in front of Congress in 2002, I said, if you want to worry about a state, it shouldn't be Iraq, it should be Iran. But this government, our administration, wanted to worry about Iraq, not Iran. I I knew why, because I'd been through the Pentagon. Right after 9-11, about 10 days after 9-11, I went through the Pentagon and 
I saw Secretary Rumsfeld and, and Deputy Secretary Wolfowitz. I went downstairs just to say hello to some of the people on the joint staff who had used, used to work for me. And one of the generals called me in. He said, sir, you got to come in. you got to come in and talk to me a second. I said, well, you're too busy. He said, no, no. He says, we've made the decision we're going to war with Iraq. This was on or about the 20th of September. I said, we're going to war with Iraq. Why? He said, I don't know. <laughs> he said, I guess they don't know what else to do. So uh, I said, well, did they find some information collect connecting Saddam to Al-Qaeda? He said, no, no. He says, there's nothing new that way. They just made the decision to go to war with Iraq. He said, I guess it's like we don't know what to do about terrorists, but we've got a good military and we can take down governments. And um, he said, I guess if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem has to look like a nail. So I came back to see him a few weeks later, and by that time we were bombing in Afghanistan. I said, are we still going to war with Iraq? And he said, oh, it's worse than that. He said, he reached over on his desk, he picked up a piece of paper, and he said, I just, he said, I just got this down from upstairs, meaning the Secretary of Defense office today, and he said, this is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years starting with Iraq and then Syria, Lebanon, Libya, Somalia, Sudan, and finishing off Iran. This is a memo that describes how we're going to take out seven countries in five years, starting with Iraq. My fellow citizens, at this hour, American and coalition forces are in the early stages of military operations to disarm Iraq, to free its people, and to defend the world from grave danger. And then Syria. We had a chance to talk about uh, a, a wide range of international issues, including the situation in Syria. Uh, and I have to say that all of us who have been seeing the terrible pictures coming out of Syria and homes recently uh, recognize it is absolutely imperative for the international community to rally and send a clear message to President Assad that it is time for a transition it is time for uh, that regime to move on, and it is try time to stop uh, the killing of Syrian citizens by their own government. Lebanon. They both had different reasons, the State Department and the White House, for wanting Israel to do it, encouraging them to do it, and supporting them. Our Air Force worked very closely with the Israeli Air Force for months before this, not necessarily with a deadline knowing when it would happen. It was always going to be whenever there was an incident, they would take advantage of an incident. Of, it would, the word I used was fortunate timing when Hezbollah grabbed some of the um, Israeli soldiers in early ju July. That was then a pretext, I think that's the only word, for a major offensive that had been in the works a long time. Libya. Today we can definitively say that the Gaddafi regime has come to an end. The last major regime strongholds have fallen. The new government is consolidating the control over the country. And one of the world's longest serving dictators is no more. Somali. Well, violence isn't only on the rise in Afghanistan. In fact, it looks like America's shadow wars have now increased by one. Drone strikes have long been reported in Pakistan and Yemen, but now there's news that a week ago, a U.S. drone aircraft fired on two leaders of the Somalian organization Al-Shabaab. Sudan. President Obama is sending 100 combat-equipped troops to Central Africa to advise local forces on getting rid of one of the continent's most vicious operatives, Joseph Kony, the head of the Lord's Resistance Army, a group responsible for atrocities across the region. It's the first open deployment of U.S. ground combat power to Africa since the Black Hawk Down incident in Somalia in the 1990s that killed 18 troops. U.S. troops may wind up now in Uganda, South Sudan, the Central African Republic, and the Democratic Republic of the Congo. It's part of a growing military effort to engage in Africa. Finishing off Iran. I said, is it classified? He said, yes, sir. I said, <laughs> I said, well, don't show it to me. And I saw him a year or so ago, and I said, you remember that? He said, sir, I didn't show you that memo. I didn't show it to you. Uh, I'm sorry, what did you say his name was? <laughs> I'm not going to give you his name. So go through the countries again? Well, starting with Iraq, then Syria and Lebanon, then 
Libya, then Somalia and Sudan, and then back to Iran.